Today's presenter is Dr. Ping Gao, who is director of AbbVie Inc. in Chicago. Dr. Gao obtained his PhD in analytical chemistry from Purdue University and spent over 27 years in the pharmaceutical industry with stints at Upjohn, Pharmacia, Pfizer, Amgen, and Abbott. He developed his scientific and technical expertise in the area of pre-formulation, formulation science, and drug delivery. Please enjoy Dr. Gao's lecture. My name is Ping Gao. I'm working for a pharmaceutical company called AbbV. Um, my work is doing um, the drug products development. Today, it is my good honor to be invited here to NIH to presenting a lecture on enabling formulation technologies for improving oral absorption of poly water soluble drugs. As I'm working for uh, industry, so I'm really limited by how many uh, examples I can really be presenting to you. So I'm really use the best literature data plus my own research work uh, in the slides and trying to share with you some fundamental concepts and also case studies of this enabling formulation technologies. Well, and this is outline of uh, my talk. First, I give you an introduction. Second, I will talk about what are the enabling formulation technologies, which are really listed here in four categories below. One was the pro drug, one was the nanoparticles technology, another the lipid formulation technology. The last one um, is the amorphous solid dispersions. There, we are trying to give you a general overview, the mechanistic understanding of the improved absorption with these formulation technologies, and I will be draw conclusions at the end. First, when we're really working on the drug, we call the API. API called active pharmaceutical ingredient. That's basically the common name of the drug. You're starting with the drug as a powder. Really, you give the patient is, is the oral drug products. It's either presentable in the pills or capsules, tablets, or sachet, but they need to be formulated. Formulated means you really have converting the, the drug powder to be um, adding other excipients that will be at the drug products and must be bioavailable and also stable, means chemical, physical stable, and also manufacturable. So how do we really make the API goes into the auto drug product? This is called a formulation. When you really have drug products really take orally into your GI tract, the drug product will go through multiple process, which is kind of um, uh, pictured here. First, you go to your stomach. You really could have a disintegration of the drug products in the stomach, which really become break down into particles, powders. Then really, the powders will be goes to the GI fluid, goes to the small intestine. The major absorption would happen in the small intestine through the membrane. Before you really get to the uh, absorption part, the drug powder has to be dissolved in the solution. That means the drug really in, has to be in the solution. So the dissolution is one of the first important steps. The second one really the solution touch the membrane, the drug, part, the drug molecule would pass through the membrane in order to get really absorbed. So this is the kind of two-step process, which is outlined here. The first step, you have the really drug particles will be dissolving into solution, reach the concentration in the lumen. The CL means the drug concentration in the, in the lumen. The second step is the drug really have to touch the membrane, goes penetrating or permeate through the membrane to the portal vein, which is go to systemic circulation. The first is dissolution, the second is permeation. And two major steps are considered the most important uh, factors in uh, the drug absorption process. There's a multiple dosage form. First, we call it immediate release, which is indicated here as a very fast, high Cmax, which quickly decline. Another drug product type called extend release, which reach 
uh, high concentration, but not the highest. You, you're trying to control the concentration in the body by control the release rate. So these two very different types, one called immediate release, one called extent release, and which is a lot of time based on the therapeutic activity, we want to be either IR or ER. So in this lecture, we only talk about immediate release because most of enabling technology can be used for extent release. The, ma the majority of work which I'm talking about uh, today are really within the IR type. As, uh, <clears throat> as I just mentioned that we have uh, two major uh, uh, steps. One is the dissolution, one is the permeation. These two parts actually relate to the major attributes of the drug products we call a solubility and permeability. So this is the BCS scheme, which is stand for biopharmaceutical classification system, BCS, was proposed back to 1995. Now it's very well adopted by the FDA, which is as a general guidance. On the BCS one and three, this is a category with a high solubility. That means you have really could dissolving the drug which is less than 250. This line here is more 250 mL. So you really can dissolve the total dose of the drug within a 250 mL of water, you have high solubility. With high solubility, you could have a high permeability, that's a BCS type one. You could have a low uh, uh, a permeability, that's called a BCS type three. On this category, we, we consider the solubility is good enough, but really depending on how the drug really uh, be uh, penetrating or, or, or permeable to the membrane. On the uh, right hand is with low solubility, with high uh, uh, permeability or, or low uh, uh, permeability. So this BCS2 and 4 drugs, which are most time considered very challenging. For instance, with the BCS2 drug, even the drug is highly uh, and permeable, but as the solubility is low, which is, means not really being able to dissolve in the GI tract, which is really require a large volume of water in the system, which we don't have. So this is on the BCS2 and the 4 drugs, you really need using uh, enabling technology in order to deliver the drug. The BCS uh, system has really been uh, become a very major concept to driving our uh, drug uh, product design and, and, uh, and develop process. This simplifies the drug absorption by two primary factors, that's promoting understanding of the key biopharmaceutical properties, which is most important with guiding selection of new chemical entity. NC stands for new chemical en entity with a meaningful criteria and expectations for how we would you try to uh, understanding what are the challenges really facing for a uh, new drug uh, products. And also really helping us to improve the efficiency with focus on overcome the major challenges. And it is very widely used by regular guidance by FDA or by, by European EMA which is for clinical studies and biowaivers. Before we talk about the detail, I'd like to give you a general understanding how is the challenge. The major for the oral products for BCS2 and 4 compounds is the high dose number. The dose number is defined here is the dose of the total amount of drug divided by 250 mL. Why 250 mL? It is a little arbitrary it is con considered is the most commonly used volume in the GI flu. So even though this is arbitrary number, it has been very widely used for this concept. So the dose divided by 250 mL, that's kind of concentration, divided by C star, C star is the drug solubility in the, in the medium. If the dose number is very high, for instance, beyond 10 or 100, we know that those numbers really could present a big challenge. The second concept here, we call it a maximum absorbable dose, which is 
really treat our GR track as a, as a pipe. You really have the drug concentration which is necessary in order to get the maximum amount of drug really get absorbed. So let's say you have a solubility CS, it's listed here as one microgram per mil. If we give a dose, about 250 milligram, even with the highest PE, you could really get all absorbed up to 5%. If you really go to solubility again, 10 microgram per mil, you could boost by a factor of 10. If you really go to 20 microgram per mil, you could really almost to 60 to 100%. You really have the high solubility here, so you can really get completely absorbed. So the concept here is you really have to work on the solubility in order to get the high, the complete absorption of the drug. But we normally we don't have a high solubility. So the key concept of the enabling formulation is can we generate a temporarily supersaturated state? Means the solubility of the drug, it is one microgram per mil. But can we use any technology to make the drug really reach about 10, 20, even 30 microgram per mil, then we could really sustain it for a short period of time, which on hours. We don't need it days or months. We only need that every hour or two hours, even it's slightly longer, then we could really boost the oral absorption. So this is the, one of the key concepts I'm going to refer back and forth in the multiple times. Let's back to the a dissolution rate. The dissolution is the first step which really requires the drug to be absorbed. The dissolution rate here is well uh, described by, by the uh, a noise a Whitney equation. The DMDT is the dissolution rate, the proportion of the D is the uh, diffusion uh, uh, coefficient, H is the uh, diffusion uh, uh, thickness. This is uh, fixed. However, the particle surface area A, the CS is the concentration of the drug near the surface, the CB is the bulk, the A, CS, CB are variables. So the key objective here, if we really want to enhance DMDT, we could really enhance the surface area, that's mainly the particle size reduction. We could really use the surfactant to, to solvarize the drug to increase both CS and CB. We could also use the morpher solid dispersion technology to in increase both CS and CB. We could also use the prodrug. So this all the technology are very much based on to change the three variables, A, CS, and CB. So now I'm going to talk about enabling formulation technology in four categories. First, let's talk about prodrug. So prodrug essentially is a parent drug attached a chemical, a, a chemical function group which change either the solubility or the absorption rate. So really, you have the moiety which is really attached to parent drug, but this, the, 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 the moiety has to be off, in the, either in the GI tract before or after. So this is the drug with attached a new functional group, which we call a new chemical entity, will be more in the, in the, in the, in the biological environment, really back to uh, chemical or biochemical process, goes to transformation, relieve the parent drug uh, separate. This is a well-known case for uh, HIV, uh, uh, drug with a for AIDS. This is the parent drug which is have a very low solubility with about a 41 microgram per mil. With attaching the chemical function group which is phosphate related function group really increase the aqueous solubility about eight times higher. And this is really has been marketed as a pro-drug in the market which is as from GSK. And this is give you a much better chemical stability and also as a bioavailability. 
this is table are really uh, from very recent uh, review articles talking about the pro-drugs approved by FDA since 2010. The pro-drug approach has been very widely approached, used for either enhanced solubility as well as enhanced target delivery and to, to improve the uh, uh, permeation and so forth. So prodrug has been very much widely used to, to fundamentally alter the drug's physical, chemical, or biopharmaceutical uh, properties to make the drug a better for uh, human use. Now I'm changing the gear to talk about the nanoparticles. The nanoparticles is based on a very simple concept. We give amount solid, you really break down to pieces. When you break down to pieces, the become some very small particles, they present a large surface area. Here's a very simple uh, a math mathematics uh, uh, analysis. Let's say take a cubic. The cubic with, with the fixed dimensions, we change the particle size smaller, you can really change the, the surface area. The surface area will be proportional to the particle size, it's the smaller, the larger uh, particle size. Uh, the smaller the particle size, the larger the, the surface area. When you really have a large surface area, the, the dissolution rate will be different. Here, we're talking about the particle size, which is with given the solubility, if you have a large particle size with 10 microns, it takes minutes. If you really go down to solubility low to one microgram per mil, with one micron particle size, it takes 30 minutes. If it goes down to so low solubility as 10 microgram per mil, even as one micron, take about two hours. We know that a human GI transient time is very short, only limited to three to four hours. So the dissolution rate here are very important factor if you, you have to reduce the particle size when you have a low solubility compounds because you want to really shorten the dissolution time. Only here, you look at this particle size, when you reach a low solubility, you have to be in a nanoparticle size range in order to within 30 minutes to a few minutes time window in order to get a drug really dissolved in the GI tract and get a really get drug absorbed. So this is the study from Merck. They're talking about one of the drugs really reduce the particles, giving the drug in a solid suspension with a different particle size. You can see the PK profile are, are fundamentally changing from 5.5 micron particle size, will be increased the PK profile when the particle size reduced to 1.8 microns, further reduced to 0.48. You can see the PK Purifier get much better, get a high Cmax, get a more complete absorption due to the particle size uh, a reduction. When you have the particle size uh, a reduction, you're also facing a two different uh, scenario. The first uh, a scenario is the called a dissolution rate unlimited, and here you see. When the particle size, you starting with 100 microns, go down to 80, 60, down to 20, the, the fraction of the dose absorbed really changing as you reduce the particle size. And this analysis is done by Dr. Yu, which is published in 1999. This is very well proved by the, our clinical uh, practice. But when you really have another case, which is that you have a very high dose number, which I just mentioned, uh, that when you have a high dose number here, the particle size reduction, uh, uh, the, the, the improvement are very limited. Here it demonstrates different doses. The red dose is 250. The green dose, green curves represent 500 and 1,000. So you can see these three curves, which indicates no matter how you do with the highest dose, the fraction absorbed will be limited no matter how you redu reduce the particle size. So the particle size 
re reduction really could be very limited when you have high dose number. So when you use the enabling technology, this is one of the factors we have to take into uh, consideration. The tricor is one of the products in the market which utilize the nanoparticle technology. This drug is a phenofibrate, it's a BCS2 compounds. If you're looking for the dose number, it's about 38, which is actually inter very interesting case here. The rule of thumb is if the dose number is less than 50, you may be still be able to use nanoparticle technology. If the dose number is really beyond 50, the technology probably will be considered not very uh, useful. And this is the, the clinical data in humans, which is indicate with the original non nanoparticles, which is typically uh, the phenofibrid capsule on the market with the red curve. You not have a complete absorption. When you have a nanoparticles based tablet, you can see the boost of uh, CMAX and AUCs. You have much better uh, a bio availability. On, on the left hand, on the right hand here indicates when the dose form, when the dose form given is the fat or fat state, almost the same AUC. The food does not have an uh, impact upon the drug absorption. That's a good sign. That's, that means patient, you don't have to take food when you're taking the uh, drug products. If you use back the old patient, uh, uh, old capsule, the patient has to be really being take care taking the, 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 the drug product with the food in order to get a maximum absorption. So when you use the nanotechnology, we really promote a complete absorption of the drug, which means you also really, you don't have to worry about the food effect. <clears throat> Here I'm just trying to give you a general summary how the application of nanoparticles technology, which is certainly you can use for improve the rate of Absorption, which you change the Cmax, shorten the Tmax, you could really improve the extent of, of absorption, which basically is a high AUC. And this has been very early on used because the nanoparticle can, can be easily work in the laboratory, so it can be more broadly used for talk studies in early discovery phase. On the drug products, can be used a parenteral in a, in other uh, uh, pulmonary so forth. This is the table. I, I selected list five commercial products using the nano technology for oral uh, applications. This is the, if you look at it here, they're looking for these drugs are really basically have high log P. They have um, the, the dose are not necessarily too high. So this make the drug products within a reasonable dose number, which is, can be used to the nano uh, technology. Now I'm changing the gear to talk about the lipid-based uh, formulations. The lipid-based formulation, which is very much based on the old concept, you have to use a surfactant. Surfactant is a molecule you could have a hydrophilic, a lipophilic balance, which is HLB, which is, means the surfactant will forming the myocells in aqueous environment, especially with the high HLB uh, surfactant. And this surfactant will be solubilize the lipids to forming the oil in water uh, emulsions. In our body, we normally only forming this is with the surfactant on this category in order to get drug really solubilized. The lipids, if common lipids, like we take an eating oil, the, 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 the food oil, so forth, they'll have a low HLB. So this is really not very good. So surfactant is a very important part in the lipid-based formulation. A lot of time, our body will generate biosalt, which I'm talking a little bit just later. The biosalt actually is a very fact surfactant which can solubilize the lipids and also forming the bioacid mixed myocell, which is solubilize the drug, which can really be helping 
uh, deliver the drug. One of the key important factors talking about here is the critical myocell concentration CMC. So the fact has been used in the search amount to generate, to, to suppress the CMC in order to be forming a myocell. The drug, in this case, the green particle to be solubilized in the myocell. In this case, we, we call it solubilization. So the drug concentration can be increased because the, the drug partition into the myocell. With lipid uh, formulation, you have to have almost the full component. The first one is a solvent. Normally, you don't have much choice for human use. One is ethanol, propane glyco, PEG, glyco, uh, uh, glycerol, so forth. As I said, we have to use the high HLB surfactant, which you, such as commonly used the tuning, vitamin E, TPGS, quimophore, so forth. Lipid, you could have a variety of different lipids, which are called a fatty acid, or you could really have uh, a glyceride, which you have uh, depending on the the fatty acid chain lens, you could have a variety of different lipids. However, when you have the lipids, you typically use have to be combination with the surfactant and also with adding solvent in order to really make the drug products really be emulsified, which is which you indicate here. This cartoon indicates the softer gel containing the drug, solvent, lipid, surfactant, and really can be released in the GI tract in the water and forming a micro emulsion or emulsion. In this case, we, most time we design a drug which is, it tend to be self-emulsified. I mean, you don't need a lot of agitation. The drug really, the formulation, when it encounter with the GI in the, in the water, it become an emulsion or micro emulsion droplets. And this is, you don't have a dissolution barrier, so this could be very rapid uh, mixing uh, with the water in the GI fluid. And the lipid as effect may undergo the lipolysis in the GI tract, which could also affecting the physical state of the emotions, which I'm going to touch a little bit on in, in my lecture here. Depending on the formulation concept, you could really could have the complete solubilization of the drug that means you don't want any drug be having a supersaturated state in GI, such as a good case here is the Nero. I'm going to talk a little more on this case. Or you could have a, intentionally to design the drug products to forming a supersaturated state. In this case, you need adding polymer, which is indicated here. You need adding polymer trying to help in the drug kept in the supersaturated state. The concept is going to, to be discussed in the next few slides. Let's first talk about Nero cyclosporin. Cyclosporin is a very well utilized old drug, which is being used in the organ transplant, so forth. And you're looking for the structure, it's almost a peptide structure, have a low solubility. And there's two commercial drug products in the market. The older one back to 1990, it's called a Sandumine. I think the new role was introduced in the 1992, uh, which is have a much different formulation in terms of the content of the, of the lipids. Here, I listed all the, the, the component here, which is, you can see the difference on the lipid here is the surfactant and the lipid. That's many actually generate a very different emotion in the centimeter, you generate a coarse emulsion. Coarse emulsion in the particle size about two microns to five microns. With the needle, you generate a micro emulsion, which certainly is much smaller, about 30 nanometers. And also because of use the lipids difference, they have a different dispersion. They also have a very different response in the GI tract. Look at it here, it's the clinical study results. This is the centimene, the AUC divided by dose. Centimene was the neuro on different dose. The neuro consistently showing almost two-fold 
better AUC. So this is really means the neural formulation are better bioavailable. If you're looking for the food effect, the cinnamon have a significant food effect, the neural have much less. So that means patient, you don't have to take the drug with the food, with neural. This is probably the most important part with the difference. With cinnamon, the AUC or the bioavailability of the drug very much depending on the secretion of the bioacid in the GI tract. This is really a clinical study. You will have the T-tube open, which is bypassed the biosol. The patient almost have no absorption. So that means for the organ transplant patient, if you don't have the biosol secretion, you really cannot really make the drug really functional. In contrast, the neuro have almost independent uh, uh, performance. It doesn't doesn't matter if you have a biosalt product or not. This makes the, the Nero are far better products than Sandamine. A list here are multiple lipid-based formulations on products. This is uh, from different company for different indications. These are really uh, well marketed drug products and look at the log D, essentially beyond three to five. So this is typically used for very hydrophobic drug uh, products. Now I'm talking about another case which is called a, the drug can be really kept a super saturated state in order to really get the drug really absorbed better. The Cytococ still on the market, which is uh, for the um, very important pain relief. When they really used the, for marketed products, the capsule con containing a crystalline drug, which is generally the low CMAX, which is not really very good for pain relief. They also have significant food effect. That means you really want to take food in order to boost the, the bile uh, availability. So that time we are trying to work on to demonstrate, to, to really investigate how can we really try to create a drug product with a high CMAX which is really uh, needed for pain relief. This is the first concept study was really designed the drug products and we're using in vitro tests as well as in vivo dogs, in, in vivo studying dogs trying to understand how the drug uh, performance. This is the same formulation with the polymer which is 4% HPMC. This is the same formulation without a polymer. They have a very different concentration profile upon in vitro a release profile. The red curve here means we have a 4% HPMC. The drugs tend to be stable in the solution and also presentable for long hours, about six hours. And this, trans this translated into dog studies, the red curve versus the, the black curve, you have a significant difference. This is almost three times better on the AUC and the CMAX. And the reason is because we use the polymer here, try to capture the drug in the supersaturated state, and this drug really can quickly absorb. That demonstrate the supersaturated state is the one of the primary factors can enhance the drug absorption. And this is the clinical data in humans. And the, the black profile here is really use the commercial current commercial capsules which is used as comparison. This is the, the, the blue curve is used the suspension. The suspension particle size starting with nano, then, then so you can see slightly high Cmax, but overall the AUC are comparable to the commercial drug products. Look at the red curve. The red curve is a softer gel which is containing the super saturable self emulsified drug uh, uh, delivery systems, which you really you have threefold CMAX and twofold AUC compared with the a commercial uh, capsule. This is really indicate you have a rapid and complete absorption of cytococcus when you're using the right uh, uh, technology. Now I'm talking about amorphous solid dispersion. What being 
amorphous. We know the drug really, most time we have the drug in a crystalline state. The things are really arranged in a crystalline lattice. The drug products are really have a high crystal lattice energy. The drug really have a fixed melting point. If the, the molecule really are disordered, that means you don't, they don't have a long range, three dimensional a molecular arrangement. So there, there are no such a melting point, and the drugs really are very much randomly uh, uh, combined, uh, uh, forming called amorphous solid. They are behave almost like a liquid. So this is, they don't have a high crystal energy, so their dissolution rate will be much improved. So this is the cartoon we indicate. We put the drug mixed with the carrier, which typically is the polymer, and really making a solid dispersion, which is trying to as a API. The concept was very much discussed back to 2009, which indicate can we really change the drug solubility and in the GI to reach to high enough? Then, because the because of the supersaturated state is not really a stable state; it's metastable. So the drug really essentially forming a, a, like spring, put the drug concentration high enough and gradually decrease. They call it a, a, a parachute, so it's landed on. I here give a definition of degree of supersaturation is the concentration difference between the concentration reached level with intrinsic drug solubility. So the difference really here, C divided by S intrinsic, is, what is called apparent degree of uh, uh, supersaturation. If you read it for very scientifically uh, uh, definition, this should be really free drug concentration minus the intrinsic solubility, then divide by the solubility. So this is really a, almost a pro approximate definition for you to either to follow. We know that the drug really tend to have, have a strong tendency to crystallize. So they are reaching a critical nucleation concentration. They're going to uh, crystallize as uh, a solid. We, it is very difficult to measure the critical nuclear concentration, which is CNC. But we can really try to, using experimental approach, try to determine at what kind of concentration they're going to uh, uh, crystallize. Fortunately, we, we find out this critical nu nuclear concentration is not a constant. You can really change the critical nuclear change the CNC by adding polymers. The polymers are really being interfere with the nucleation process, which is really being slowed down or really all preventing the drug uh, uh, precipitate as a solid. This is the four polymers we commonly use. One of the first one is the PVP, another one is called a copolvidone. These are pretty much uh, hydrophilic polymers. We could also have HPMC and HPMCAS. They are a little more hydrophobic polymers. And these polymers are very commonly utilized in the drug products with a solid, amorphous solid dispersion nowadays. There's a different manufacturer paths. The commonly utilized are the two types, when we call spray dry, the drug and the polymer dissolved in organic solvent. You really spray dry, making uh, a powder. They use the powder to be a starting uh, a material. Another one called a, use the thermal extrusion process. You can mix the drug polymer and really goes to the extrusion process, really become dense uh, uh, a substance. You could generate uh, the drug polymer in three different states. The ideal state is that we call it a solid solution, which is stable. The drug really completely molecularly mixed with the polymer and forming a very stable 
a system. Another, you could have a morphous drug really more as the clusters in this matrix, which is not very good, which is called a metastable. The last one, which is undesired, is the crystalline drug in the matrix. You cannot really make a drug really. We do have the circumstance like this. This is the, almost the tell us this is not really a good uh, a system. So you really, you have to be really trying to identify what you're generating with a solid state. Ideal case, you generate a molecular level solid solution in order to use the amount for solid dispersion. I'm going to discuss the case here, which is with every drug products. We have the, this is for the AIDS patients. The first drug is called a, a Rutanavir, which you see the high dose number here is 250. And we, normally, Rutanavir is a PCAP booster. It's really be used for promoting the other drugs called a Lopranavir for, for its the, the medical uh, treatment. Lutonavir is a free base, which is using a, a highly pH sensitive solubility. With a crystalline drug, you see in the low pH, you have a solubility is very low, about 0.4 microgram per mil. But with really amorphous drug, you can really reach a four milligram per mil. On the right uh, figure, demonstrated have a very different uh, intrinsic dissolution rate, which is about 10 times better, which is corresponding to the enhancement of the, the solubility uh, improvement. So by using a morphous drug, you can really enhance the dissolution rate because the solubility uh, increase. This is a study we did in the dogs, which demonstrate ASD standard for amorphous solid a dispersion. If you use 10% AST with 20, 30%, you see much better performance than the physical crystalline mixture, which is 10% PB, which is PB stands for physical uh, um, a mixture. And indicates that how the bio performance is very much sensitive to drug loading. So 10% of the drug loading give the best a performance. This is consistent with our understanding. We have a more hydrophobic drug content in the ASD. You tend to decrease the dissolution rate. So this is the part of the reason. This is the commercial products. It's called a, a culture. It is uh, combining the two drugs which you just talked about, rutanavir and lupranavir. This is manufactured through the hardmatic extrusion process. And both the drugs are present in morphous state. And with this drug, we replaced original market capsules to, to reduce the three capsules by two tablets. We demonstrated new food effects. That's very important. And also we have a room temperature storage that the patient can carry all the time. So this is really enhanced the patient compliance and very good products you can carry on, you don't have to take a food. So this is a, a much better product for AIDS patient. I'm going to talk on another case, which is uh, a research case. This ABT072 is a drug which is used for HCV candidate. We test in, uh, in clinical because the clinical efficacy, so the drug was not really advanced to drug products. But all the studies done here are used to human for proof of concept. If you're looking at the, the drug, have a very high log D of three, and have a two PKAs, which is highly pH sensitive. The solubility is highly pH sensitive. In the GI lumen, if you look at the pH seven below, the basic solubility is constant, less than 0.1 microgram per mil. The dose project is 100 to 400 milligram, give a very high dose number. So this means we know it's a very highly challenged drug we need to work on for oral. This is the clinical study results. 
which give you uh, four different uh, uh, formulations. The first one we call a amorphous solid dispersion tablet using the polymer called a cupavidum. The WG stands for wet granulation process. AC tablets means the two different composition. They slightly different in their uh, composition. The capsule, which is basically is a crystalline drug mixed with other excipients, which is used for clinical studies which have low, uh, low dose. So the, the relative bioavailability was listed in from clinical studies. The AST gives the highest, which uh, normalized by the dose. The wagonation tablets gives about a 50%. The capsule only gave about 16. So this the study in in vitro demonstrate the, how important is the supersaturation. If you're looking for the capsule, the black curve essentially is essentially on the bottom, a very low concentration by our in vitro test. The WGWC, which is in the short-lived, short-lived concentration and quickly go down, means the drug release reach a high supersaturated state then collapse. They decline at back to the low uh, concentration. Only the blue curve here, which is reached a high concentration and lasts about two hours. And this is really due to the supersaturation of the drug was kept in the solution because we use the right excipients. And this indicates the amount of, of the polymer used with the drug. In ASD, you, the drug polymer ratio is 1.5. In a well granulation, I use much less polymer. In the capsule, it is a no polymer. So this is really indicates if we use the right drug polymer ratio, you can cap the drug, you can keep the drug in the GI concentration high enough in order to boost their bioavailability. This is the uh, commercial ASD drug products currently available on the market. If you're looking for their log D, uh, typically three and to five, and dose number is high. You can look at the dose. So this is very much reflecting the ASD technology are very much effectively used for uh, hydrophobic drug uh, molecules. Finally, I touch about the, the mechanistic understanding of improved absorption. What is the polymer doing trying to, to keep the drug in a supersaturated state? So when really drug polymer are in the homogeneous solution, without a polymer, the drug tend to be crystallized in the crystalline uh, nuclear, which is forming a crystalline lattice. So if you don't have a polymer there, so the, this pathway is very much naturally goes to from supersaturated state, crystallized, become a, a crystalline drug, and back to a very low solubility. We have a polymer here, we call the poly, polymer crystallization inhibitor, which is called a PCI. You really can preventing that path go through. You only can go to amorphous because the, you have a polymer absorbed on the nuclear surface really trying to uh, interfere with the crystallization process. So the drug products cannot be really forming a crystalline, but forming amorphous solid. The, the amorphous solid become aggregates together. So you can really effectively try to using the polymer type or the right amount relative to the drug, try to control the crystallization process in vivo. So this is the most important concept truly not necessarily with amorphous solid dispersion, and also with the lipids based, they also can use for prodrug too. So, so this is the very most important understanding how the polymer be very effectively trying to changing the crystallization process in vivo. This cartoon tells what happened in vivo absorption. We typically have a three paths for oral. 
If you don't have interference, this motor drug dissolving, forming a free drug, get absorbed. With lipid, you could really have surfactant, you really form in emotions and goes to lipolysis and get absorbed. Our nature body secrete by salt and we're forming a bioacetate mixed micelle, the BAMM, stands for bioacetate mixed micelle. This really can solve by the drug. We normally have a food effect because this pathway. So if we really we want to manipulate the different contributions, we want to minimize the food effect, we have to min maximize the, the two pathways. The super saturation is very highlighted here is you're trying to raise the drug concentration, the free drug concentration high enough, you really make the drug go through this pathway, super saturation pathway. If we went with the lipid based, you really have to use the drug forming the right lipids, surfactant, goes lipolysis. So these two pathways I'm highlighting here are most commonly used for the amorphous solid dispersion or lipid. Uh, uh, and those two forms. By understanding the absorption pathways, which can be really guiding us, how do we choose the right functional excipients and how do we really control the drug release rate, so forth, in order to really get the best drug products. Finally, I'd like to conclude in my talk, we talk about how do we select and this enabling technology. We talk us at least the four different enabling technologies. How do we make our decision? The most important, we have to look at our drug molecule. And we're really looking for the, the, the molecular properties, the physical chemical properties. Here, I'm using a very simple parameter, TMTG. This is basically looking for representing the driving force for crystallization. On the x, on the x uh, axis, are using log p as indicator. For log p, typically less than two and a half, we call it a conventional technology, means the drug is not too hydrophobic. You can really use conventional, such as crystalline drug mixed with the functional recipients. You don't have to really use enabling technology. Only when the drug gets very hydrophobic, which typically log P beyond two and a half. A don't treat this lines are, are, are very rigid line. This is sort of the very much the fuzzy lines. We really have the high log P, you could use pro drugs commonly utilized for all kinds of hydrophobic drugs. You can use it for nanoparticles, you can use it for morphous solid dispersion, and you can use all different categories. But the nanoparticles typically used only for high melting point, and which you cannot really use the uh, amorphous. Amorphous solid dispersion commonly utilized a very wide range, but with too high log p, you have to really go to lipid, because it tend to be lipid are really could really try to enhance the absorption, which is the amorphous solid dispersion could not. Further understanding of the chart probably really require a lot of scientific understanding of why this technology has certain uh, limitations. This slide I'll give you a little more general table. You can look at it as a general guidance. For the pro drug, the fundamental advantage is you can modify the molecular property for optimal bioperformance. You can improve solubility, permeability, and a target delivery. You could also gain the new chemical entity with IP opportunity. But the challenge or the cons is sometimes, and most times, it's very difficult to predict or to manipulate in vivo uh, uh, a cleavage kinetics. And this is very important. And because it's a treated new chemical entity, and you have to submit a completely different tox package to FDAs. So it really take a more time, resource, to develop such a uh, package. For nanoparticles, it's a very simple process. It's suitable for dissolution rate limit absorption. And you can 
manufactured with a good physical stability. The challenge or cons is it's not really good for drug with a high dose number. And really high drug loading of nanoparticles could really have a problem with the physical, uh, with, with the physical stability. With lipid-based, as I talk about, you have a lot of advantages, such as you don't have a dissolution rate control process. You can really solubilize the drug and promote for better absorption. Can sustaining a supersaturated state by which to use the polymer. And with lipid manufacture process, are most are just the mixing and filling into the capsule. They're much simple. And also one topic I didn't talk about, the, the lipid can really try to direct the drug absorption through lymphatic process, which is uh, very uh, important, but not really commonly needed uh, pathway. The cons is the solubility of the drug may be very limited in the vehicle, means the functional excipients. Because it's in the liquid state, you may not have the best chemical physical stability. We know the chemical stability of the molecule in the liquid state are much worse than in the solid state. And you don't have many choice of the solvent or surfactant used for uh, approved drug products. So that means you have very limited vehicle component to be select. And some toxicity for chronic dose of the excipients for chronic dosing, which might be questionable. In contrast, the morpho-solid dispersion technology are most broadly used now for, for poorly water-soluble drugs because you can really improve the dissolution rate, can try to sustain a supersaturated state. You could have a diversified manufacturing process, which is you can really choose the best for your drug products. And also, the scientific understanding are much be better nowadays. The cons is the drug loading may be limited. And if you really have the thermal sensitive drugs, thermal, you may not choose the hot extrusion, which is could causing the problem. The polymer can be used for this technology is limited too. But certainly with the four polymer I just, just mentioned are most commonly used. They can really try to, at least at time being, can satisfy our needs. One challenge is here, you may have looking into a predictive or long-term physical stability because the amorphous drug tend to be, have long-term physical stability issues. You also have to have the looking into packaging selection in order to make sure the drug products are physically stable. Finally, I'd like to give you more, uh, my conclusions is the biopharmaceutical property of the new chemical entities are really dictate the application of enabling formulation technologies for improving their bioavailability. Fundamentally, if you have optimal new chemical entities property, that would minimize the use of enabling technology, which is good. You normally you don't want to go to extra miles to with enabling technology, which is really will um, have um, resource and time uh, uh, a requirement. However, if you do cannot have um, optimal drug biopharmaceutical property, we have to choose the right technology based on understanding of the drug molecules such as also consider the drug loading, consider the manufacturability and the physical stability and so forth in order to choose the, the right technology. Finally, the scientific understanding of this technology and understanding of each key attributes of such technology with relevance to the drug are critical. That's really dictate the success or failure of the drug products. I selected list the reference for major topics listed here for your further understanding of each enabling technology. 
this is certainly, I just provide a very short, but I maybe a little bias. But I find that if you really want to learn each technology, this might be an easy way to identify this review articles or research papers, try to get some ideas how this technology can be utilized. Finally, I'd like to thank you very much for your listening. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, submit the questions to the PCP course uh, uh, coordinator. I'd be happy to uh, further providing any uh, um, scientific uh, answers or trying to help you to digest um, this topic. Certainly, uh, further study on yourself probably will be needed because this is a very complex field. Today, I'm just limited to very few examples, try to give you a fundamental or quick overview of the technology available, which is certainly not in the right depths. I'd like to stop here and, and thank you again.